गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन टू जॉइनिंग इन फॉर दिस थर्टीन सेशन ऑफ हेल्थ जन वी एवरी वी कैन बी ब्रिंग डिफरेंट डॉक्टर्स ऑन आर सेशन और वी ट्राई टू यू नो कवर अप दैट हेल्थ केयर गैप दैट इज क्रिएटेड इन आर इंडस्ट्री वी स्टार्टेड एज कोविड जानकारी वे वी हैव कोविड फिफ्टी थाउजेंड स्टेट वाइज वॉलेंटियर्स प्रोवाइडिंग आज वेरी रिलायबल एंड वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट यू नो इंफॉर्मेशन रिगार्डिंग कोरोना एंड द रिसोर्सेज now we also we were also working with tomato in feeding india initiative for feeding stray people and stray dogs and pets and now we have we are going to the next step of this and trying to become health jankari where we are trying to provide information uh, where we are trying to provide information about every aspect of health every different uh, uh, you know tips and tricks and myths trying to bust out the myths and we have special uh, specialist coming to our session and you know helping out the healthy people the patients and everyone so for today's session we have dr tushar grover who is an ophthalmologist uh, and he is currently uh, joining in today on uh, this health jankari session uh, disha uh, can you take over yeah so uh, very good afternoon uh, afternoon doctor uh, so mm-hmm. dr tushar is a profession surgeon specialized in cataract and uh, cornea and refractive surgery uh, his experience and his knowledge the list is endless he's been awarded uh, his video was awarded in cataract of cataract and refractive index as the best video in uh, uh, like American Society of Cataract and Refractive in that refractive surgery and uh, moreover uh, his experience on this field is uh, very wide so we welcome you doctor thanks disha thank you for having me and it's a great initiative that you guys are doing in and educating people about health conditions thank so thank you Uh, so we will start with the questions that are based on our jandas, and uh, yeah, so we have a basic journal uh, health tips or yeah. like basic tips to have a proper uh, eye for proper eye vision, and then we have a specific like cataract and taking diabetes and eyes. Yes. Can so sure. should we start? Let's yeah. go ahead. So we can start with whatever you yeah. would like to discuss first. Yeah. Just a minute. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, we'll start with the journal tips for students because uh, eyes, uh, especially, uh, you know, people. We are more into now into desk jobs. Whether I think it's like universal now. Whether they are students, whether they are people, especially. during this lockdown i mean uh, during this pandemic where you know uh, we all are working and we even all of us we also we are interacting through our screens okay. and virtual meetings right yeah. so eyes is is the i think more than the brain we are using our eyes so uh, so what are the basic journal tips what are the basic uh, things that one should do uh, especially while using screens and stuff yeah so you're absolutely right i mean screen time for all of us has has increased tremendously now since the lockdown days and and uh, work from home is yeah. the norm now and probably going to be like that even once the hopefully once the pandemic is over if the pandemic is over but yeah. the thing is, so there has been a lot of rise of people with dry eye related complaints people with a lot of burning ish burning sensation foreign body sensation grittiness in the eyes a lot of strains headaches eye pains etc so see of course because our work demands it there's no running away from the computer screen we have to use it uh, what is really important is to take frequent breaks because um, you know there is something called the 20 20 20 rule you might have read about it um, so every 20 minutes take a 20 second break look at 20 feet so that's what the rule says doesn't exactly have to be 20 second or have to be exactly 20 feet the object the point is that you know when you're constantly doing near work particularly on the screen you're constantly straining uh, your eyes and you know you you don't end up blinking enough when you're working on the screen as well so that causes dry eyes 
and that causes straining. So break that cycle of constant near work every 20 minutes, every 30 minutes, and maybe walk around, talk to people around you, have a glass of water. So, so that, you know, your eyes are able to relax. So that, that is extremely important. You know, people do work 12 hours, 14 hours a day for work. And I mean, use the screens for work and you can't tell them not to, you can't tell them don't do your work, but you have to take frequent breaks. Apart from that, you know, it's important to see how your surroundings are. So for example, like uh, for that matter, I have a bright light reflecting on my screen right now. So that's yeah. not good. Uh, if I keep working for 10 hours like that, you know, bright light reflecting on my screen, that is going to cause a lot of straining as well. Uh, if you have windows that are open, try and, you know, have some curtains or some blinds because you don't want bright sunlight reflecting on your screen. That creates glares. Uh, that's an important factor. Apart from that, you know, your screen has to be at an adequate distance. It's about about an arm's length. Uh, just okay. is in good shape, but your back and your neck doesn't hurt as well because those things also eventually contribute to all these things. Apart from that, because then over prolonged period. It should be a good balance, you know, not too dull, not too bright. So these kinds of settings are very important for people who use screens for multiple hours a day. So that's important. Okay. Uh, so, so like, uh, you know, when you have strain or something like that and people start putting uh, eye drops or some natural remedies, they do oiling and stuff. So yeah. what are the things one should avoid putting on their eyes so uh, so a simple lubricant drop uh, there are various brands available it's over the counter there is not really an issue with that because uh, that is harmless no major side effects and okay. it just keeps your eyes moist so i have nothing against anyone using a lubricant drop but if you do have straining consistently and if it is for prolonged uh, period of periods of time multiple days do see an ophthalmologist make sure you get yourself checked because there can be other factors like, you know, an untreated refractive error, maybe a cataract or something which, where your vision is impaired. So then that will cause these symptoms to worsen out. So if you do have these symptoms for a prolonged period of time, do consult an ophthalmologist. Okay. And uh, accordingly, treatment can be given. Uh, apart from a lubricant drop, I would not advise anyone to, you know, use drops on their own. For example, a lot of people that we know, uh, patients that come to us have been using steroid drops, even if it's a weak steroid or a strong steroid for, for many months, because it gives them huge relief. Steroid drops are the most helpful in terms of relieving your symptoms. You'll have a white eye, you'll be comfort, comfortable, strain-free, but over prolonged periods of time, they can have disastrous consequences, huge side effects. So those things need to be avoided. And, you know, apart from using a simple over-the-counter lubricant drop. If you're using any drop, do it only at the prescription of an ophthalmologist. Okay. Uh, so, uh, like, then what, what, like, what are the things like, you know, eye makeups, kajals and all that stuff. Is it safe to use? Yeah. Especially you... it's a huge thing in... Yeah. So see, these are things which if I tell you, if I tell the audience not to use, it's not going to help because they're still going to use it. So it's, it doesn't make sense for me to like prohibit these things because they're not harmful in the general population. A certain subset, a small number of people could have allergies to these particular things or maybe a certain kind of, uh, I, I mean, a certain kind of kajal or a certain kind of mascara. So those people need to be treated for that allergy and they need to avoid it. So if you do develop symptoms, if you do have itching, a lot of people have itching post using these products. So if you do develop that, do consult uh, an ophthalmologist and you can be treated for the allergy so that it can be picked at the right time. You know, if it's not picked up and you keep using a product that doesn't work for you, that doesn't suit you, causes you okay. uh, allergies, then um, that can cause problems. If it's detected at the right time and treated at the right time, then no problem. And obviously try and avoid things that go inside the eye. I mean, if it's as long as it's on the eyelashes, uh, that's fine. But something that goes inside the eye and can potentially be toxic to the surface of the eye should be avoided to the extent possible. Okay. Uh, so like summing up it, like what 
uh, I being a student, what should I do to relax my eyes at the end of the day? Yeah, so to sum up, the most important thing, in my opinion, is to take frequent breaks. Uh, you can, being a student, you can study for 20 hours a day if you want, but do take frequent, uh, frequent breaks. Don't do it continuously because especially with screen use, that creates a lot of problems. And apart from that, good hydration is important because if you're dehydrated, you will have more chances of dry eyes developing. And uh, I mean, I, I said 20 hours a day, but no, you should get about six to eight hours of sleep at least as well, because a lot of people who come to us with say, say they have a lot of strain in their eyes and, and you know, they have a lot of dryness, uh, discomfort, they, have, they say they have headaches, but then you ask them, you know, how, how many hours do you sleep? They said we sleep three hours in the night or four hours in the night. So that is again a huge cause uh, for all of these symptoms. So good sleep, good hydration, an adequately balanced diet. For at least for adults, I wouldn't say anything specific is needed in the diet, but overall, a healthy eye lives in a healthy body. So a good balanced diet is important and good sleep and frequent breaks is I think the one takeaway that I would want everyone to have okay. because that's really, really important. So constant screen use is what leads to what we know of as computer vision syndrome because uh, that creates all of these multiple things which people then start wondering if they have any major problem because they have headaches and you know all kinds of symptoms which come in the broad group of computer vision syndrome. So frequent breaks is the one takeaway that I would like everyone to have. Uh, coming to the next part of questions that yeah. are related to cataract. Yeah. And so what is the main cause of cataract? Like, yeah, yeah so, I mean, what is the main cause of the problem? Yeah, so cataract is the most common uh, problem that we deal with as ophthalmologists. It is essentially an age-related process in most people where the clear, there is a lens inside the eye, which basically is a refracting surface, transmits the light onto your nerves. So that becomes cloudy because the proteins and the cells in that become denatured and that leads to clouding of that clear lens, which prevents the light from entering the nerve of the eye. So that leads to a gradual, progressive blurring of vision. It's painless, uh, doesn't cause any pain or anything. It just it gradually leads to diminution of vision in individuals. And but there are other causes as well. So, for example, somebody who's using steroids a lot, like I told you, some patients come to us having used steroid eye drops for months or years. These can qu quicken yeah. the process of development of cataracts. So those people can develop premature cataracts. Sometimes, you know, in in children as well, if there is an abnormal metabolism happening in the lens, that can also lead to clouding. Uh, then there are other factors. Diabetics tend to get cataracts earlier. So these are these are factors, but Essentially, it's an aging process that happens in almost everybody. So some people develop a cataract at the age of 40, 45, some develop at 60, some at 80, some at 90. But essentially, over the lifespan, most people do develop a cataract. Okay. So like uh, you said, uh, people gradually develop it, right? And uh, if situation gets where it's obviously harmful. So what are the signs and symptoms that, you know, people of middle age, or even you said children sometimes have it. So what are the symptoms that we can look for and have an early visit to our doctor? Yeah, so the, the, the only symptom to begin with for cataract is blurring of vision. So if you feel that your vision is not adequate, even with your glasses, that means you could be developing a cataract. So that's an important sign. So don't, okay. uh, don't just try to manage with what you have. Do get yourself checked. Uh, and sometimes, you know, what happens is somebody's, uh, say, one eye is uh, is normal. So they, they can see well with that eye. The other eye sometimes develops a huge mature cataract and they're not aware of it. So yeah. it's important to, you know, notice uh, if you develop a diminution of vision and don't ignore that. Get yourself checked. You know, if it might just be a glass power, might not be a cataract. Uh, but But it's important to get yourself checked if you see any blurring of vision, if you feel that your quality of vision has deteriorated. Or even if, you're, if you feel your power is changing quite frequently. So that's also a possible sign of an early cataract. Okay. Uh, so like if it is un left untreated for longer period of time. So yeah. what, can other, what can be other effects of it? So a cataract, uh, if, if a cataract becomes extremely hard, becomes mature, 
prolonged periods of time that can lead to development of glaucoma so glaucoma is another condition that we talk about so that can basically cause the pressures in the eye to go up which can damage yeah. the nerve which can you know basically cause permanent damage to the eye apart from that what really happens is that you know our technology for cataract surgery now is extremely advanced so if you if you let a cataract become really hard the technology that we use now cataract surgery becomes a little more challenging you're likely to have more uh, swelling after the surgery there is a slightly higher chance of complications because uh, now what we do in cataract surgery is that you know we just make a 2.2 mm incision and we enter inside the eye with that and using an ultrasound probe we just divide the cataract into multiple pieces emulsify it aspirate it inside the eye so harder the cataract is the more challenging that procedure becomes the more energy we have to use and consequently the more swelling you end up developing so it's important to you know get diagnosed at the right time and the problem should be addressed at the right time okay so like you already mentioned what are the uh, treatments available for it yeah right? so essentially uh, uh, so there is a it is a yeah 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 go on go on go on you yeah so uh, is it a myth or uh, you know is it true that contact lenses can uh, cause cataract or they can lead to cataract using frequent using contact lenses frequently can lead to uh, cataract okay so yeah good question a lot of people do ask that contact lenses by themselves cannot cause cataracts but what contact lenses can do yeah. is cause corneal infections so you know contact using contact lenses is fine as long as the individual is willing to take the care that is needed with those contact lenses so it's important that if you're wearing contact lenses don't use it for more than 6 to 8 hours in a day make sure you know if you're using monthly disposable for example change your uh, okay. solution the contact lens solution every day in that case uh, wash that case every day with the solution clean the lens with the solution every day and never ever sleep with your contact lenses on a lot of people do sleep with contact lenses on <coughs> excuse me that that can really lead to disastrous corneal infections I and mean, i'm a, a cornea specialist so we deal with a lot of corneal ulcers and those are extremely difficult to treat so take the right care if you are using contact lenses and only use contact lenses if you're willing to take that care if you're not then use glasses or you know find another way out or do a lasik <laughs> and again about cataract there are uh, cataract there are a lot of myths yeah, again associated that's important. With it. yeah so for, for cataract there are again a lot of other myths associated like if you can prevent it yeah. uh, does does diet help in or some drops that help prevent cataract no all of that doesn't happen there is no way to prevent the development of cataract you uh, will develop a cataract when you do develop a cataract so uh, and you know and uh, the, the treatment essentially is only surgical there is also no medical treatment for cataract no drops can treat cataract or no drops can you know prevent the progression of cataract. okay so and another thing that you know people do ask a lot is uh, should i wait for the cataract to mature before i get surgery done because that that's an old concept that that has been embedded in people's minds that you know cataract yeah. pakawa hona chahiye before you do the surgery so again the answer for that is absolutely not cataract surgery in today's times should be done as soon as it starts affecting your routine activities just because you have an early cataract doesn't mean it has to be operated on but if that cataract is impairing your routine activities is is affecting whatever you do in your routine life whether it's your work or driving or anything then that is the right time for us to operate on that cataract so that is important yeah especially in india to they we have this thing they delay the uh, yeah. you know procedure and yeah. till it gets to the worst situation Absolutely. so that yeah. actually so stand... i think that uh, contact lens information is <laughs> all right so and contact lenses also do cause allergies in some yeah. people so yes. again if you're wearing contact lenses uh, do get checked regularly there is contact lenses also lead to more incidences of dryness do lead to dryness do lead to allergies so important to and all of these are more common in people who use it extremely frequently and use it for prolonged hours so if you use it for a 
six to eight hours, not longer than that, and maintain all the other hygiene habits that I mentioned, then you're a lot more likely to be comfortable with contact lenses. Okay. Like people generally over here, especially in mid twenties and you know teenagers, yeah. they start using by themselves without even consulting doctors. That's so right. I think that's a important information out there for everybody. Uh, so as you mentioned about glaucoma, and so I I would directly come to that also that yeah. you know uh, there a journey there are no symptoms for glaucoma and it's it leads to serious problems later on. True. So how can, uh, you know, as an individual, we can know about it yeah. and uh, get treated at the right time? Yeah. So glaucoma is also known as the silent thief because, you know, what really happens with glaucoma is your central vision remains intact. So if you're looking at a point, you're, you're, you're seeing that point, that stays intact till the advanced stages. But your field of vision starts uh, narrowing and starts constricting. So when you look at a particular point, you don't just see that point, right? You see a whole field around that. And what happens in glaucoma is that starts constricting. But that's extremely difficult for an individual to be able to tell by themselves if that is happening. Uh, what is important is to get yourself checked yearly and for every individual, I believe. And for young people, once in two years is also fine. But especially if you're above the age of 40, at least once in a year, you must get yourself checked. And the only way that glaucoma can be diagnosed is by assessing the pressures in the eye, which can be measured with a machine that, that most ophthalmologists will have, and by looking at the nerve of the eye, because the nerve is what starts getting damaged. So what essentially happens in glaucoma is that the pressures in the eye are high because of, and because of that, as a consequence of that, the nerve in the eye starts getting damaged. So in most cases, it's a very gradual, progressive deterioration of vision. And whatever, whatever damage happens to the nerve cannot be undone. We cannot, with any surgery or medication, we cannot undo the damage that glaucoma causes. So the only way to really uh, manage it is to detect it early using uh, measurement of pressures and looking at the nerve and then to treat it with medication and bring those pressures down with medication so that further deterioration doesn't happen. Because we can prevent further deterioration, but we cannot reverse deterioration that has happened. So that's why it's extremely important to get yourself checked routinely because you wouldn't know by yourself that you have glaucoma. And especially for somebody who has a family history of glaucoma, yeah, exactly. extremely important to you know, get yourself checked every year so that you, you, if, you're, if you do develop signs of glaucoma, you're treated early on. In most cases, it can just be treated with drops. The pressures can be brought down so that further deterioration doesn't happen. In rare cases where the pressures are extremely high and we are not able to bring down those pressures with drops, we do advise surgeries. And in those cases, surgeries have to be done, but not in most cases. Okay, so like uh, it cannot be stopped until or unless it is not, uh, you know, detected at or Absolutely. diagnosed at the earlier stage. Right? Absolutely. Yes. And one should always get, after like 40 years, uh, you should go for a regular checkup. That's like the... After the age the of 40 years, of a yearly this. examination yeah. is extremely important because it's not just uh, for glaucoma, but for a lot okay. of other things which are hidden and which you might not find. And, you know, if, if they're detected early, they can be treated. And But if they're not detected early, then you might have irreversible loss of vision. Okay, so it's like an age-related problem that you end up having in four forties or mid middle age. Uh, in in most it. individuals, yes. Or and is it common in even in younger people? Yeah, it is most common in people above the age of forty. But uh, again, like like with cataract, there are exceptions. There are some individuals okay. who are born with the uh, glaucoma. You know, because the the mechanism for draining the fluid in the eye is not well developed. So they can have pressures, high pressures at birth as well. And again, steroids can cause high pressures. Somebody who's had trauma can have high pressures. So there are exceptions and younger individuals also can have uh, this thing, uh, glaucoma, but essentially most commonly it is in people above the age of 40. Okay, so like any specific uh, diet modification one has to do when suffering from glaucoma or something like that? No, no. The only way to reduce pressures uh, in the eye is with drops. So diet modification 
like i said it's it's important a healthy eye lives in a healthy body so it's important to have a good diet for general ocular health but as such specifically with glaucoma there's nothing that uh, diet can do okay uh, so like coming to uh, next set of questions that are like basic exercises uh, for eyes for a for a good and a clear vision yeah okay so i think uh, so again like you mentioned myths there are quite a lot of eye exercises that a lot of people do you know like rolling their eyes around look in different directions which are advocated yeah. by a lot of people but to be honest holding I mean, pencils yeah yeah so holding pencils does have merit but a lot of these other eye exercises that i just mentioned there's not really much scientific evidence to say they even work so i mean you can do it if if you know you like doing them but there is not much scientific evidence to say that those exercises work because a lot of people do that you know move the eyes around and look here look there all of that not going to harm you in any way yeah. but it's not going to make much of a difference at least that's what science says uh, but as you mentioned about the pen exercises one pen two pen exercises that those do hold relevance and those are useful in individuals who have certain problems like if somebody has something called a convergence insufficiency for example both your eyes have to fuse at one point and look at one point right some people have weak muscles of the eye and that can be diagnosed with okay. certain basic measurements that we do and basic tests that we do so in those people it does help to do those single pen one pen two pen exercises and there are some cat cards etc so those do play a role uh, in individuals who have certain specific problems uh, certain specific weaknesses of the muscles and they should be done under the supervision of an optometrist at least to begin with or an ophthalmologist of course to begin with and then carried on in people who really okay. need it but a lot of the other exercises are just uh, myths uh, which really don't have i'm not saying they don't work if they work for you great but i'm just saying there's not much scientific evidence to really support them so i wouldn't advocate them and i wouldn't say that you must do that okay like it's not the essential thing if you like it just do it like that exactly exactly because i mean see as as uh, as surgeons and as clinicians we have to basically advocate and promote wherever there is scientific data and published data which backs it but a lot of these exercises apart from the ones i mentioned uh, the for the insufficiencies don't have much scientific evidence so like i mean doesn't make sense for me to advocate them too much Okay, I think there is an issue in the internet. Yeah. So I'll just continue. So, yeah. uh, like you were telling us about exercises. Uh, uh, so, uh, apart. So starting about uh, apart from exercises, uh, what about diabetes? How does diabetes affect your eyes and how does lowering sugar is going to affect the high health yeah so that's a very important question diabetes can have uh, huge consequences on the eye uh, basically there are various things that diabetes can cause on the eye which includes uh, early cataracts uh, you know and uh, changes in the refractive error but what really we need to worry about with diabetes and what is the most common and what is the most disastrous at times is diabetic retinopathy so our our retina uh, the nerve of the eye has a lot of blood vessels and diabetes as you would know is a disease of blood vessels it affects the small vessels and so the eye is no exception uh, what happens is it starts prolonged uncontrolled diabetes leads to you know damage to these blood vessels so they start becoming leaky they start leaking blood they start creating these small micro aneurysms or blood clots then uh, you can have swelling of the retina that can develop uh, and after that all of uh, you know as a prolonged phase there can be abnormal blood vessels that develop in the eye because of diabetes and those blood vessels are leaky they create scars they can actually cause your retina to detach so again with diabetes you can have um, permanent loss of vision if if your if your blood sugar levels are not controlled 
and uh, again so for for diabetics essentially extremely important to get a dilated retinal examination the, are you aware what dilated would mean dilated means you should you have to put drops uh, dilate the pupil and then take a look at the retina every year and if there are signs of any swelling signs of any abnormal vessels then those have to be treated with injections or with lasers and in people who do develop a detachment of the retina you might need surgery and you know the outcomes are not as great as say with a cataract because if you had a lot of damage to the retina you might have a significant amount of permanent loss of vision so most important thing is to keep your sugar levels under control and you know it's the eye is also a window to your body so if you have damage in the retina of the eye because of diabetes you're also likely to have damage to your kidneys and to your other organs so extremely important to keep your sugar levels under check extremely important for diabetics to get a yearly checkup uh, because diabetic retinopathy can be disastrous and needs to be detected on time uh someone has actually asked in the chat that how does bp affect you know eyes and healthy tips for those yeah. patients and i was about to come to that but now they have asked so let's just that's you know good. go ahead with that yeah so that's good so again like uh, like blood sugar bp can also cause damage to the retina you can have uh, something called as hypertensive retinopathy so those blood vessels uh, thicken up and they can have problematic issues apart from that in hypertensives it's extremely common to have vascular occlusions so what happens is that you know because those blood vessels get occluded in hypertensives you can have huge bleeds in the retina and so that also uh, can have extremely bad consequences so essentially very important to control your blood sugar levels and your blood pressure levels and if you do see any deterioration in vision sudden onset report to your ophthalmologist immediately because that those kinds of issues need to be treated as soon as possible so in terms okay. of keeping in terms of tips for keeping eyes healthy yeah. for high bp patients as is asked in the question i would say please do keep your blood pressure levels under check and i think that's the only thing you can really do to keep your eyes healthy because if your blood pressures are not controlled then there's not much else you can do definitely having a normal blood pressure normal blood sugar that's all a part of lifestyle and you need to have those to have all absolutely. your body parts healthy absolutely i think there are some questions on lasik if you would like maybe i can yeah 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 uh, i just wanted to have one question actually you mentioned about dilation so yeah. i wanted you to tell how important it is to get your eyes checked by a dilation method and not just normal you know yeah. normal that you people go to a optical shop and they just yeah. sit in front of that machine and watch that balloon and just <laughs> get their eye tested but yeah. somehow you yeah. everyone should have that you know that dilation done proper testing yeah because yeah. Uh, can you just explain why yeah so glad you asked that so what really happens when you just go to an optometrist or an optical shop and get your eyes checked is they just check your power um, and you know they give you glasses but like we discuss so many conditions like glaucoma like you know diabetic retinopathy these are all hidden inside the eye uh, you need a thorough examination by an ophthalmologist to be able to detect these conditions an optical shop person is not going to be able to detect these for you and dilatation uh, i mean i'm sure i hope you all are aware well, the pupil is the central black part of the eye so that is the the opening it's sort of if you have a camera you have an aperture right so the pupil the black part of the eye is the aperture of your i which is also a kind of a camera with those and what happens behind that is what we need to see with dilatation so you need to open up that aperture so that we can really examine the whole eye the retina the nerves all of that lies behind and even the lens so even early cataract changes any glaucomatous changes any retina changes you know that needs to be detected by dilatation using drops and a lot of people have weaknesses in the in the periphery of the retina on the sides of the nerve layer so all of that can be only picked up by a thorough retinal evaluation by an ophthalmologist so it's important to get a yearly as uh, as you mentioned uh, a retinal a, di a dilated retinal examination because without that there is a very very high chance that you'll end up missing uh, some of the silent um, diseases that are residing in the eye thank you doctor uh, uh, 
I think audience have a lot of questions coming up, and we might be out of time for that. So yeah, let's just quickly start last with LASIK before. surgery yeah. and and what are the side effects about? It. Yeah. So see, I think um, LASIK because the question starts with side effects. I'll say LASIK is one of the safest procedures that exists on the human body. Having said that, no procedure is absolutely risk free. LASIK also does involve certain risks, but the chances of serious complications, the chances of vision threatening complications happening are quite low. And uh, see, what is important is that, you know, you see somebody who's a refractive surgeon, who's a specialist at this, you need somebody who has the right equipment, you need to be able to get your scans done, which are able to predict and see how your cornea is. So if your corneal shape, corneal thickness, there are various other parameters that we look at if they are all normal. Uh, then LASIK is essentially quite a safe procedure. I, there is no procedure in the human body which you can say is 100% safe, but it is one of the safest procedures there is. And essentially, in the right hands, with the right diagnostic tools, with the right measures taken, it is an extremely safe procedure. And uh, so uh, somebody also wants to ask about the new form of LASIK. So LASIK essentially when it came out was a, a procedure which was done with a blade. So the, in the cornea, which is the outermost refractive layer of the eye, the transparent layer of the eye. So that is the cornea. So you have to create a small flap with a blade, lift it and then do the laser. The newer forms of LASIK have replaced that blade with the laser itself. So the laser itself creates that cut and you have to lift that and then do the laser. So that really adds to the safety levels because a blade can to a certain extent malfunction or not function to the extent uh, you know optimally the way you want it which doesn't really happen with uh, with the with the all laser bladeless procedure so essentially the safety levels have increased quite a lot uh, is it painless i would say it's uh, it's not pain free but the pain that you have is quite low. During the surgery, there's hardly any pain. You do feel some pressure, some touch sensations, but there is really minimal pain. I mean, um, most patients, 90 out of, I mean, 95 out of 100 patients will say absolutely no pain. 5% patients are more because of anxious and, you know, worried. So they get a little jittery, but it's not really pain. On And on the day the surgery is done, you do have a little bit of discomfort, foreign body sensation, some watering in the eyes. Your vision will be a little blurred on the day of the surgery. The next day, when you come for your post, post op day one visit, your vision is quite good. You're quite comfortable, and uh, you know you're you're doing quite well. So, if pain is something you're worried about, I don't think you should be worried too much about in terms of LASIK. And uh, side effects. Commonly, what really happens in a lot of people is a little bit of dryness does develop and sometimes you you do have a little bit of halos around light all these things do happen and these do tend to settle down with time so essentially quite a safe procedure but i always tell all my patients that you know some patients say ki hamari aankh kharab hai chashme ki power hai hame theek karani hai and that's so that's not how it is glasses contact lenses lasik they're all good options it's about what you want if 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 I mean, Hardik is comfortable with his glasses. So why should he get rid of those glasses? Nobody has the right to tell him that, you know, no, you should not wear glasses. So if somebody likes to wear glasses, then glasses is also a good option. If you don't like glasses and if you want to get rid of them, then LASIK is quite a safe option and you can go ahead with it, provided you have gotten all the required scans done and you're getting it from a refractive surgeon who specializes at it. Uh, sir, one more follow-up question on this. What yes. are the post-operation care and treatment procedures that a patient should follow? Exercise the drops and certain habits that they should adapt so that to have a proper, you know, post-operation. Post right? yeah. yeah. Okay. So essentially what uh, we really tell our patients is avoid water going into the eyes for a week because that's extremely important you do not want any infection to happen because the, the one week post-surgery is the most critical when there is, uh, it's extremely rare, but there is a possibility of infections happening with any surgery. So it's important that you avoid water from going into the eyes for a week, take a bath from below your you know neck levels and also avoid dust. Uh, a lot of people ask if they need to wear dark glasses all the time. Dark glasses are not really that important all the time at home, especially. 
uh, you have you should wear it on the day of surgery because you will have some discomfort and uh, post that couple of days when you go out in bright sun you can wear it so that you are comfortable for us in terms of outcomes it doesn't matter too much so precautions we are avoid water avoid dust do not rub your eyes because as i said there is a flap that is created right so you can you can cause some aberrations in that if you rub your eyes a lot so do not rub your eyes and uh, no swimming for about 3 months swimming is not allowed for about 3 months we give drops which are essentially used for about 4 weeks and a lubricant drop for comfort which we give for longer so use those drops as well because that's also important Sir, uh, you mentioned no swimming. So, is it just swimming or bathing also on like no, no. washing you eyes can, with water? You can take that... a bath after a week. Uh, only one okay. week. You're not allowed to take a bath above this. So, below this, we don't want water going into the eyes. Like I said, for a week, you can after one week, you can do everything and resume your work. Uh, you can resume your work in three four days also if you want because. most people are comfortable one day after surgery but uh, no swimming for 3 months step That's by step good. they can take up you know work going yeah yeah so i always tell my patients that you know you if you want to start computers start work start in 3 4 days but don't start with 12 hours a day start with maybe 2 3 hours a day and then gradually keep increasing because we want you to be comfortable you know because suddenly you have a little bit of dryness and you're using drops they have preservatives as well so suddenly you start using a lot of computer you tend to feel a lot of strain you feel some dryness so that troubles people so i always say start with a couple of hours and then get back to your routine whenever you're comfortable okay so a quick uh, audience question do conditions like thyroid and pcod and pcod also also affect the health of our eyes yeah so typically thyroid does uh, what thyroid can cause is enlargement of the muscles of the eye so that can cause protrusion of the eye and uh, that can cause double vision it can prol over you know uh, time also cause a loss of vision because it damages the nerve so all of these things are important so if you have if you have thyroid and if you have some redness in the eyes constant watering foreign body sensation do get checked if you do feel that your eyes are a little bulging a little bit out uh, and you have thyroid then that could be a sign of thyroid orbitopathy so that also needs to be evaluated and uh, you know then we would also need to check for signs of any damage to the nerve so yes as you said thyroid typically does cause damage to the eyes okay so uh, i have a quick question about transplantation eye transplant corneal transplant yes. and eye donation Yeah. how like people are not very aware about it but it's very yeah. safe and corneal transplant is one of the safest procedures ever made and like it's been done since centuries so can you just you know shed some light over that and you know tell our patients and our you know everyone our audience how eye donation is a very you know good cause and and it helps so many people around the world yes absolutely so so uh, there has always been a huge deficit between the number of corneas that we need for transplantation and the number of corneas that are available so it has been helped you know the awareness has been created thanks to the campaigns where ashwarya rai was involved namita bachchan was involved so that has to an extent helped to a great extent create awareness so it's extremely important to you know let your eyes be used by somebody after you pass away because you're eventually like transforming their life you know essentially and a lot of people are worried that will it will my will i look disfigured or you know it it's not like that um, so what we usually do when we when we take eyes from somebody who's passed away and their family wishes to donate eyes is we place a a, a, a shell which which looks just like a normal eye and we also close the eye to a certain extent so the eye doesn't look disfigured for somebody who uh who has donated their eyes and you know is has passed away uh and uh, so all of you can find an eye bank near you and pledge your eyes so you can always inform the eye bank that you would be voluntarily willing to donate your eyes whenever you do pass away because that's an extremely noble thing that you can do and in fact not just the eyes even other organs but talking about the eyes you can pledge your eyes every eye bank will have a pledge form so you can mention your details on that and pass it on to the eye bank so your name will be in the record and of course it's important that 
you know uh, even though you have pledged it's important that family members are aware so say somebody in your family passes away uh, you can just call the nearby i bank every locality has a four digit number also so so that depends on which area you are in and that there is a four digit number that you can call which will connect you to the nearest i bank available and you just have to inform that that this person in my family has passed away and we would like to uh, donate their eyes and they'll be more than happy to you know come take the eyes they'll you'll be you'll get a certificate of acknowledgement for for your noble gesture and you'll end up saving somebody's eyes and corneal transplantation uh, uh, is is quite common now it is something that is done in a lot of patients there are quite a lot of people who are corneal blind who have say post trauma had injuries and they have a white cornea or who have had infections in the eyes so a lot of those people who are actually blind can have extremely good vision for the rest of their lives uh, should uh, you know they get a cornea okay okay so uh, can you tell one more thing how what kind of patients that the transplant uh, you know helps like what kind of blindness is cured and how many yeah. patients of this problem are there in this world yeah so the only uh, the only part of the eye that can be used for transplant is the cornea like i mentioned and uh, cornea is the outermost layer of the eye the outermost refractive surface so somebody like i said who has corneal blindness some there are a lot of people who have retinal problems right like nerve issues those people cannot be cured by transplants uh, unfortunately because Uh, science has not reached that level yet but a lot of people have corneal issues which is the outermost layer of the eye and uh, those people can be helped by corneal transplantation so somebody who has had who has lost their vision because of glaucoma diabetic retinopathy or you know blood vessel occlusions because of blood pressure like we mentioned they will not be helped by a by a transplant but somebody who has had infections in the eye or somebody who's born with a defect in both the eyes and the cornea somebody who had trauma all of these people can be helped by transplantation okay okay one quick audience question we had so many questions planned but i don't think we'll be able to cover okay. today so i hope we have this amazing sessions again and you know we have for our audience i would like to tell we have these sessions every weekend so you can always connect with us and always have similar doctors coming up and telling your questions so one audience member kiran has asked what is the solution for having a very high power like minus 9.2 yeah so uh, minus 9. Point, what is the, for very high power like my, she's mentioned minus 6.25 so minus 6.25 can actually oh see yeah so something like minus 9 is usually treatable uh, if you do want to get rid of glasses there is no compulsion having a glass power is not a disease uh, but if you do want to get rid of glasses it can be done using what is called phacic iols or icls so they are essentially lenses that are implanted inside the eye uh, they are relative to lasik a more recent development they've been there for the last 10 12 years 15 years maybe and they do extremely well as well so uh, so somebody who is uh, probably not suitable for lasik because they have an extremely high power is usually suitable for icls or phacic iols and that is a procedure that can be done and that also leads to extremely good visual outcome so if you do want to get rid of glasses you have a high power uh, you can get is it. this procedure for both uh, long sighted sightness people and short sightness people no so essentially see when you uh, when you cross the age of 40 you are going to get reading glasses Okay, okay so that that hmm. that lasik or icl both essentially in in the most typical forms there are newer variants available which do try to address the the reading power as well but they're not as established yet so both lasik icls etc basically take care of your power for distance but when you do turn 40 you will need glasses for reading but you will even at the age of 40 50 or whatever you will be free of glasses for distance and your routine activities but you will need glasses for reading with both of these options okay one more question i have and this is specifically for my mother to watch do okay. eating carrots or vitamin a helps you remove the glasses <laughs> so see uh, eating carrots doesn't help you remove glasses because that's the specific question that you asked 
but eating carrots is a healthy thing it is it it is full of vitamin a and vitamin a is extremely good for the retina of the eye the nerve of the eye so uh, just because it doesn't remove glasses doesn't mean that it's not helpful it is extremely helpful and it's extremely good for you so do have carrots but don't expect it to take your power away glass power away because that is not going to happen yes yes that's what i've been telling <laughs> her all the time that it won't take my glasses off but it will make my retina healthy and now i wanted a doctor to say that so it's fine yeah but but you should still so, eat carrots uh, yeah definitely okay, okay. so one more question i got from my audience before uh, yeah. how does std you know affect eyesight there are cases of syphilis and some gonorrhea which are sometimes babies are infected with these kind of chlamydia they are infected with chlamydia and eye infection yeah. so how is how can std and eye be related so uh, essentially as in for a newborn if std is transmitted through the mother they can cause uh, corneal infections and they can cause conjunctival infections because they are passed on during birth or you know through the placenta at that time syphilis also has a lot of other consequences syphilis doesn't just cause an infection in the in the cornea but it can also cause uveitis it, it can involve the nerve of the eye the retina of the eye a lot of people who come with a reaction in the eye we have to investigate and some of them do end up being positive for syphilis so syphilis by itself has a huge variety of manifestations in the eye and uh, like you mentioned chlamydia chlamydia most commonly causes conjunctival and corneal infections so that can happen so like i said the eye is a part of the body and anything that affects the body does affect the eye as well okay so uh, one more thing i wanted to ask about covid and i like there have been so many post covid co- you know yeah. infections and complications in patients regarding their eyes and even during while they were suffering they got fungal infection different of different kinds and there was so much confusion around so much myths around so can you just you know tell uh, how covid and their its complications can affect your eyes yeah so so covid was found to have a lot of manifestations on the eye uh, including conjunctivitis uh, including uh, you know uveitis including uh, retinal artery occlusions but of course like we know the most disastrous thing that happened uh, with covid was the black fungus so you know what covid essentially does is covid lowers your immunity and that when when your immunity is lowered you become vulnerable to a lot of other problems a lot of other infections and that is where mucormycosis or black fungus also caught on because covid was able to lower an individual's immunity and covid also causes transient pancreatitis which leads to higher blood sugar levels so that again is a double problem you know because you are lowering an immunity you are raising blood sugar levels plus the person is being given steroids and steroids as we know were essential for survival because that becomes the key right first you have to survive then the eye so steroids were given so again steroids lower the immunity steroids also increase the sugar levels so you can imagine the consequences that it was having and that allowed the, the black fungus to thrive in the areas where it you know was able to grow so black fungus exists in the environment as it is mucormycosis it it is it is anyways there in the environment but our immunity is strong enough to not let it grow inside us and cause damage but in case of covid especially in people who are diabetics and especially in people who were given steroids their immunity was not able to cope up and that is what led to the development of black fungus which as we know is is life threatening is sight threatening is you know has has been very difficult uh, for all of us to manage definitely okay thank you doctor and one last quick question there have been increase in people using zero power uh, lenses but yeah. you know just for watching some laptop or doing their work yeah. and what about using laptop shields so are these recommended by a doctor or are these just you know products marketing products just yeah. for sale so for example there's a lot of focus on blue ray filters etc also right um it doesn't play a huge role because there's not much scientific evidence again uh, for it but again one thing that is also very clear is it doesn't cause any harm and using an anti reflective coating also does to a certain extent help you because it reflect it reduces the glares etc that come on your screen but if it is if it is like a dramatical uh, this thing saves i mean helps you drastically i would say no 
so what is more important like okay. i mentioned in the beginning and uh, i will try to reinforce that is take frequent breaks from your screen use so uh, you know and if you can if you can cut down maybe 15 20 minutes of your screen use that will probably be more useful and if you can take frequent breaks from your screen use that will be more useful as well using an anti reflective coating is of no harm whatsoever so if you want go ahead does it make a huge difference i would say no okay thank you so much doctor this whole thing was so informative i'll quickly tell our audience who are uh, about uh, health jankari yeah so this is a facebook page where we have constantly been uploading all the information and we are constantly uploading on our instagram twitter and our linkedin and on our youtube we have videos 250 plus videos and they are simply every weekends you know sessions and questions about busting myths about doctors coming up giving their time to tell us information that normal they are not possible in normal concentration so we have over 250 videos uh, the link is in the chat box i would request our audience to go and check it out see even our no streamer it might cause you know some infection or some problem but uh, for what what a doctor will say is the you know the correct thing so i would request everyone to go and check out our youtube and there's a feedback form also there in the chat box everyone if they can you know provide their valuable feedback to us and help us grow as a community because we bring uh it's Same kind of doctor, different specialty doctor every weekend to help you to connect that bridge between a medical professional and a general healthy person who might develop disease, but is because of you know the unawareness about that topic, is not able to take care of themselves. Uh, so thank you to Dr. Trushar for joining us today, you know, and giving us your valuable time, and. you know we hope it was a nice experience for you as it was for us thank you it was my pleasure and thank you for having me i enjoyed my time here and i hope i could be of help thank you definitely it was very helpful and this whole video as well as different questions as a small small format will be uploaded on our youtube and our social media please follow us please help us support and we'll definitely be bringing you every week some amazing healthcare content